Hey y'all. Well, if you missed the Monday monologue, I explained that I went ahead and did the fab work on this chassis. And I know I said I was going to do a really step-by-step -step build on this second one, but this chassis was pretty expensive and it took me about six weeks to get this pair. And I know in the past I've made mistakes on drilling or fab work when I was on camera you know worrying about like what I was saying and making sure stuff was on camera and then I ruined projects or at least drilled holes in the wrong places and had extra holes in projects that didn't need to be there and stuff and I didn't want to do that to this so I did do this fab work off camera but in this video I'm going to go over like how I did this fab work and kind of kind of simulate doing it so you can kind of see the process and then you know show you the end result of all the different parts and stuff we did to it and how everything's going to fit inside it because I've already done one I know how I want to do the parts layout and you know there were a couple of things that I had to kind of think about that I was mirroring and like okay the tubes not on this side of the chassis it's on this side of the chassis and some of this stuff will get kind of rearranged inside as we're building it and I can show you the differences between the two channels when we get into doing that part of it so anyway let's get busy working on this chassis okay first I want to show you the tools that I use for doing my fab work and I think a lot of people believe that you have to have like a machine shop or some fabrication shop to do this work and that's not the case. Now there are some tools that you need to purchase, but a lot of them are tools that you could use in other kind of household repair things and just they're good tools to have around the house. So let me show you what I use. Starting out, I'm gonna show you the measuring tools that I use. One of them is just a plain vernier caliper. They don't need to be like the kind with the dial, I actually prefer them not having one because they're easier to get in places. The Central Tool Company calipers are super nice. They're made in Japan. They've been making them for 30, 40 years at least like this, maybe 50. And they're easily found on eBay. When I bought this pair, I'd lost my pair somewhere. I had to buy another one. I recently found this one on eBay for $15 used and it's in like new condition and they're so much better than like the made in China ones that you could get like new off Amazon. The other tool that's super handy is this guy here that you can see it's a little longer and it's got a marking stylus or scribe on this end with a little roller here and this is really good for marking like how far from the edge you're gonna you know put things so between these two tools you can mark anything you need to accurately measure and mark layout etc on a chassis so those are our measuring tools the next thing you need is some sort of a center punch here's a little automatic type but I actually prefer just a plain little one that you use with a hammer and I've got like a little small he says it's a pretty rough old hammer but you can use any kind of a hammer with this this is a nice stare at one and again given that you know there's no moving parts those are pretty cheap to get a really nice one and getting like a, a stare at brand one you know you're never probably going to have to sharpen it or anything and it's just a high quality tool these little made in China automatic ones are kind of hit and miss whether they work and actually I bought a stare at one of these and it didn't work as good as the little china one did so take that for what it is just get a manual center punch the next thing you're going to need is a few files a little rat tail file this is a half round bastard file and this is a really handy one to use because it's got, you know, it's flat on this side. It's curved for like doing the inside of the tube socket holes to smooth them out. 
it works really good with the IEC connector square hole that's kind of hard to deal with so having a pair of files is nice and then I also have a little small round needle file like this in case I need to slightly you know elongate a mounting hole to get things to line up something like this is super handy to have for this project we're going to be drilling and tapping the mounting holes and so you want to get a five millimeter 0.8 tap then the tap will come with a specific number drill which is different than you know the inch or decimal drills or even metric drills they're a certain size made to work with taps so you want to get the tap the number drill and then you want some sort of a handle like this to you know turn the tap and keep it straight as you're threading the holes in the top of the chassis now if you're using a Hammond type chassis that's thinner metal you won't be drilling and tapping and honestly, if you don't want to drill and tap, you can just put longer screws and put nuts on the inside. It just makes it a lot easier with the chassis that I'm doing. Some of the holes are kind of hard to get to. And so threading and tapping them made it a lot easier. And that's all you need to do that. Now the next tool is a very specialized one, and that's a chassis punch. And here's two different sizes. They are used for octal sockets. This is a 1 and 3 16 And then this one that I use for the 9-pin sockets, this is actually a metric one that, let me see what size that is. It's 18 millimeters, but a 19 millimeter or a 3 quarter inch one will work fine. It's just a little slightly bigger hole. But this 18 millimeter one makes a really tight fit for a 9-pin socket. And this size also works for doing the phono stage, the little holes in the top of it that the tube stick through. So with these two sizes, you should be able to do everything you need. And when you buy them, make sure you get the draw bolt that has this little roller bearing washer thing on it it makes it a whole lot easier to pull the die through the metal when you have this roller bearing thing here so you can do this with a hole saw and hole saws are cheaper but they're going to leave a rougher finish and you'll have to come back and file them and if i was going to use a hole saw I would probably get one that's maybe a sixteenth of an inch smaller than the hole that I'm going to do and then finish it with a file or a Dremel tool to the final size so you can smooth out the kind of mess that it makes. And then this is just another handy tool to have is a Dremel tool. And you can put these carbide burrs in them and I have a whole little set of these burrs and these are just some cheap Amazon ones and they work fine the other thing I got this little kit and it came with some little sandpaper roll things and then it comes with these little arbors that has a screw and a shank and you put these little cutoff discs in it and these work great for cutting you know slots and sheet metal and so definitely a handy thing to have just around the house period so not a waste of money just getting it for this project it's something you can use on other projects in the future and these are the cutoff wheels i use they're the uh, dremel brand number 409s would not get the knockoff ones these things spin at really high rpms and you don't want a cheap one to just like fly apart and shards of it go into your face or something and or into your you know you should be wearing eye protection but still you don't want the disc to explode so it's worth spending the money and we're only talking a couple of dollars more to get real dremel ones we're almost done here coping saw and i know you go that's a woodworking tool well yeah it is and 
honestly, I haven't been able to find a, like a super fine tooth count blade, but the fine tooth woodworking blade seems to work fine for cutting out the IC socket holes. And I've tried various techniques, and this seems to me to be one of the easiest and safest. You can use a Dremel tool with a cutoff wheel, but it's real easy for that to slip and then put a big mark across the chassis, which obviously isn't ideal. And this is a lot more controllable. Plus, it's just handy to have one of these around for doing general woodworking. So, get one of those. And then, like I showed you, get some sort of a little hammer to work with your center punch and for kind of straightening up some metal if you need to. And the last tool I find really handy is this little tool that I got at the hardware store. And you'll find these in the plumbing department of a better hardware store. And they probably have them on Amazon too. And these work for deburring the inside of holes. And this little thing spins around and it's got a really sharp blade here. And it's just, you know, works great like on tube socket holes. Even if you use the chassis punch, it kind of cleans up the rough edge and any other kind of holes that you cut out, this is great for like deburring the edges of them. And then the last thing you're gonna need is some drill bits. And I've got a really nice metal drill bit set. It's got a assortment of all the different sizes and you know, I try to keep them you know, filled in when they get super dull and I have to replace them or if they um, break or whatever. So I've, over the years I've kept these this set pretty full. I'm missing the half inch when I lost it somewhere. But the big ones are also have a reduced shank. And it allows you to use these larger sizes in our standard 3-8 drill chuck, which is super nice. And you don't need a set this extensive. I mean, I've had this for years. But you are going to need a set of drill bits. And... You probably could get away with having like from 3 8 down for most uses. And then if you have to open up the holes a little more, you could use your Dremel tool with a little burr on it. Or buy that specific drill bit because the larger sizes are expensive. And then obviously you need some sort of a drill. And hear people saying you need a drill press. This is what I use. This is a ancient Makita battery, you know, drill that, again, handy for uses and all kinds of things around the house. This isn't something that's going to, like, be only used for your tube audio kind of stuff. And so most of you probably already have a hand drill, and you can get a corded one, too. It doesn't really matter because you're not going to, you don't really need a cordless one. So anyway... That's kind of the tools that I use for doing this fab work. And I just wanted to point out that this isn't something that you need like a fabrication shop to do. This is all done with hand tools. Okay, so I'm going to go over how I did the fabrication work on the chassis. I did this off camera because these are really nice chassis. And I was scared that if I was doing this work on camera that I'd screw up and end up drilling a hole in the wrong place or drilling a hole out the wrong size and that sort of thing. So let me show you kind of how I did this. So iron sits here, the power transformer, the choke's going to sit here, and the output transformer is going to sit up here. And so I set the iron on the top plate, each piece. Then I came in with my center punch and I marked each one of these holes directly onto the top plate through the hole on the tab that holds them down. On these, I had to use a Sharpie because it was kind of at an angle. It was hard to get in there. And then I came back and center punched all the holes. And then I put the transformer back in place and I made sure that these lined up perfectly. A couple of them were off a little bit. I had to re-center punch or move the punch over a little bit and strike it again and you know, get them directly in the holes on the transformer. Then I came in with the drill bit and 
started with a very small bit and put a little dimple in each hole without drilling all the way through and then put the iron down and double checked it to make sure that the holes were lined up. And then I came back with a number drill that's used with the five millimeter tap, final drilled all of these holes. And that was the first thing I did was the mounting holes for the transformers and the choke. And then came back with five millimeter tap, with a tap holder and capped all these holes out. And again, if you're using a thinner gauge metal, you'll be putting nuts on the back side, so you don't need to worry about tapping it. You just drill it the size needed for clearance for the bolts. The other thing is we drilled a small 1 8 inch hole here because that's going to be a flathead, buttonhead screw that holds one of the tag strips, and it's underneath the transformer. So then we came in and we drilled these holes for the grommets where the wires go through. And you just have to look at the transformers. You can see, like on these output transformers, the holes are offset from the mounting holes. But on the power transformer, the grommets in line with the mounting holes. And same with this choke. So you just have to look at the iron you're using and figure out where you need to put those holes. And then I've got this little grommet kit that I got off Amazon that's got an assortment of different metric grommets and really handy to keep one of these around just to have the grommets on hand. So then the next thing we did is we came in and drilled the hole here for the RCA input jack. And you just want to make sure there's enough clearance with the transformer to be able to plug this in and still keep this far enough away from the tube and you also don't want it too far forward because you won't be able to put it through because there's going to be a tag strip sitting here on this screw hole for this tube socket. And so this is our nine pin driver tube. Got these two holes and they're spaced so that they align with the threaded holes on the underside of the little tube rings that we're going to be using to hold the tube sockets down. Now you can, if you want to just use you know, a couple of button head screws. It's not as critical where you put these holes because they're not lining up with anything and you can just put nuts on the underside. And the same with this socket here. I've got these four perimeter holes drilled for the tube ring that's going to sit on top of the chassis. And then these are our ventilation holes for the KT120. And then obviously here's the punched hole for that. And then I countersunk this one and this one a little extra because we're going to be using a couple of flathead Phillips screws to hold the tube socket in place in those two locations. And to me, this is one of the hardest things to do by hand is fabricating up or drilling these holes equidistant around a tube socket for ventilation and have them look nice and even. And I just spent a lot of time, you know, with a caliper and, you know, the tube sitting on it to make sure that these holes weren't underneath the tube, but that they also were inside of the tube ring I was using. And no lie, I spent about two and a half to three hours doing this. But I think it turned out really nice. Here's where the bias pot goes. And then here's where a rectifier tube is going to be. These are drilled diagonally like this with the outboard one forward and the inboard one back because this is the inboard side of the amp and this is the outboard side of the mirrored pair. And we do that because one of the tag strips is going to mount right here and goes like this direction. So you need to kind of think that through where the tag strips are going to mount and then drill the holes accordingly so that everything's in a nice place and it's easy to work with. And again here on this hole we want to make sure there's enough distance between here and where this RCA jack is so that the tag strip can sit right here and then the wires from the RCA jack can go you know straight to the tag strip 
but there's enough room there to put the tag strip. And on this one, there's going to be a tag strip sitting right here. And then these two holes in the front here are for the test points. I mean, some people might have wanted to put them back here further in the amp. You can put yours wherever you want. And that's the fabrication of the top plate. On the front, it was pretty simple. It's just got the power switch hole here. And it's a 19 millimeter hole for the power switch to fit in. And then on the back, we have the joy of cutting out this IEC socket hole. Like I said, I used a coping saw and then used the half round file to get this to shape. Then you got the two bounty holes for it. Then down the lower part, that's the ground lug for the safety ground. And then these two holes there and there are for the choke. And then these are our speaker connectors. And that's the fab work. And this is what it looks like on the inside. And it's kind of interesting the way they did this chassis with these extruded aluminum pieces. These little X, I think they call them X beams or something like that because they look like an X from the end. But that's the way he made these. And... It definitely takes up a lot of interior room because not only do you have this thick piece of wood, you have this thick piece here, and you know you have to make sure that you're not getting into this stuff when you're mounting things. And that was the other thing. If you're going to use these chassis, make sure that the outboard transformer holes are centered in this channel and not like on top of it. You want to make sure that you're, you know, drilling into this. It's kind of hard to see here, but you can see right there, one of the threaded holes goes all the way into this thick aluminum piece, and we have long screws for the outboard holes on the transformers going through that thick metal piece to help secure them too. And then you can see back here in the back, there's these holes are threaded, and while you could, you know, put a nut on there to start it, it makes it a whole lot easier for that just to be threaded. Then you don't have to mess with trying to put a nut down there. But if you don't want to thread the holes, you can just drill them and put nuts on the inside. That's not a big deal either. But as you can see, these holes are lined up with these screws. And this hole is lined up with that screw so that it's threaded and tapped. So we can put a long screw into that thick metal piece on the inside and that's the fab work on the chassis and in the next video I can kind of show you the parts we're going to be using and then start putting all the hard parts in getting all the tag strips and tube sockets and everything installed and then we can start wiring this thing up so I think this is a good place to end this video well I hope this was a helpful video even though we didn't do the actual work on camera which I know would have been more entertaining, but I just didn't want to risk screwing these up because these are kind of, to me, a, kind of like a lifetime build amp that I did not want to mess up. And hopefully we went over things in enough detail where you can replicate what I did here on your own chassis. And again, you don't have to use these fancy extruded aluminum, you know, with oak sides chassis if you don't want to. And I'll put a, a link below to the website of the guy that makes these things. Landfall Systems is another person that makes these kind of chassis that you can get any you know size you want. And let me check here real quick. These are these are 14 by 8 for the metal part. So you know they could be a little shorter, but I wouldn't want to crowd things too much this way. Probably. Probably 12 inches is as short as I would want to go. And I think 14 is kind of a better length to give you some room between the parts. But 8 inches is definitely wide enough. And the way this thing's made inside, there is some space wasted. But there's not a lot of space wasted on this top plate about where the iron and stuff go. Because it's some pretty big iron. So, anyway... Be interested to see you guys that are building these, what kind of chassis and stuff you're using. 
show me on the forum at my website. I'll put the link below to the forum. I'd love to see you know your build and your process and you know how you're coming along with this thing. The next video, we're going to start bolting the parts inside, and I'm probably going to do a video of just kind of going over the parts because I've put out bombs before, and I'll try to put together a bomb for this too. I hate doing that work, but anyway, I'll do it for you guys. But I want to show you like the capacitors and the sizes of them and stuff in case the ones that I have the part numbers for are no longer available in six months or they're out of stock and I don't get messages about, hey, I can't find this exact part number. You know, can you tell me, can you research finding me another one? You know, I'm, I'm, guys, y'all are going to do that yourself, but I'll give you enough information where you can do that. So that'll be the next video. And then once we get all the parts bolted down and kind of go over the parts and, you know, get the major parts bolted down, get the tag strips and all that put inside, then we can jump into working on soldering up everything, which to me is the fun part. So anyway, hope y'all are enjoying the series. If you are, please subscribe to the channel. Please like the video. Thanks to you Patreon supporters. I really appreciate that, as well as people that make donations to my website. It helps me afford to be able to make these projects for you guys. So anyway, until the next segment, have a nice day. Mm -hmm.